if we know we should, like there's more in us that we are not manifesting, it undermines our self-confidence and it undermines our ability to receive full love from ourselves because we go, well, I don't deserve it, mm -hmm. right? It's not like we can deserve love from ourselves. It's not like we can earn it. But this is the part of ourselves that if we're not taking advantage of it, if we're not giving it our all, that's how we'll start to feel. Hey, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. So we are rolling along in a series, looking at every one of the 16 Myers-Briggs personality types and talking about how you can love yourself as that personality type. On the last episode, we talked about how to love yourself as an ESFP personality. This episode, we're turning into, tuning into the ESTJ personality. And we're going to talk about if you're an ESTJ, how you can use an understanding of your personality type to create self-love for yourself. You can, it's kind of a one level removed. We talked about this a few episodes ago when we framed the entire series. We also talked a little bit about this idea of our, our love is freely given. If you look at a relationship, maybe you've been in a romantic relationship or a friendship or a you know, parent-child dynamic, a family relationship, love is given freely. You don't earn love. In fact, if you earn love and it's conditional, it's not really love. So it's something else going on. So we, we talked about love is given freely, and that would be with ourselves as well. But when you're in a relationship, there's some expectation. There's a give and take. You relate and you have a back and forth between you and another person. And in there, that's where the relationship is created. That's the, that's the framework, if you will, for love to pass back and forth. That free currency of love needs a mechanism for it to carry. And so we posited this idea that just like in a relationship, you have to have the container for the love to pass back and forth freely. Well, it's the same with ourselves. We have to tune into ourselves and we have to understand that a relationship with ourselves, a healthy relationship with ourselves, allows us that interface. We can send love to ourselves, show ourselves love. And personality type is a great way to frame this and see this. So this is what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to apply it toward an ESTJ personality type. Now, if you're not an ESTJ, we're also going to talk about what can we learn, all of us other 15 types that aren't ESTJ personalities? We don't, we're not wired that way. What's something we can learn and take away from an ESTJ self-love journey? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm so glad you mentioned that we don't earn love because that's a premise of this entire series. Uh, we don't earn love, but we can earn uh, healthy relationships. Yeah. Right? Um, <laughs> Dropping my notebooks. Yeah. Like... Keep rolling. So we got we, we we got this new studio situation. I don't have a desk anymore to put my stuff on. <laughs> ESTJs know my pain. Know. And ESTJs like, no, I need my desk with my paper. Everything's got to be organized. It's yeah. too like, where do I put my stuff? Yeah. So unfortunately, unfortunately. Antonia won. It. Everybody won. I'm I, here now. I won with like the more casual thing, but then that means that Joel has no place to put his. Maybe I'll bring this like little stand over. Maybe I'll put it over here, but okay. then I can't write on it. All right. Whatever. <laughs> Keep going. We'll figure it out. I promise. <laughs> we'll figure it out. ESTJs, write in and tell me you feel, <laughs> make a comment underneath this episode let me know you know my pain that's right you have to have your resources around you yes right? available all, all my tools yeah so uh i'm glad you mentioned the concept of uh, love not being earned because that is a premise that is going through this entire series which is that we don't earn self-love we actually love ourselves a lot yeah and we're always trying to show ourselves love the challenge isn't that we can't give love the challenge is that we set up all these obstacles and obstructions to being able to receive love from ourselves and uh, and there's a host of reasons right sometimes they're coping mechanisms sometimes they're gatekeepers sometimes they're you know like we do a bunch of stuff to withhold love from ourselves and oftentimes we use it as a motivation structure like yeah. i'll i'll love myself when i've accomplished a certain thing create a reward system Yes, exactly. Yeah. And um, that's, uh, well, we'd consider that a toxic relationship in any other dynamic, right? I'll, I'll show you love when you do a thing for me. Yeah. Right? Do the dishes. I'll love you. Exactly. Right? <laughs> You'd be like, what? Yeah. <laughs> but for some reason, we're okay with doing that with ourselves. And we don't define that as a, like a toxic dynamic when we withhold, when we withhold our ability to feel the love we're trying to show for ourselves. Yeah. So uh, the premise or kind of the point of this entire series is to help an individual regardless of their personality type to find access points to not only attempt to show love to the self but also receive love from the self and we're using this uh, what isabel briggs Meyer, myers called type patriotism which is this concept that we 
we we tend to think our type is the coolest or at least we wouldn't we wouldn't actually change types not really most of us we dance with the devil we know yeah so most of us have or and should have honestly a healthy dose of type patriotism so when you fall in love with your personality type because like you mentioned that's like one step removed it gives us a little bit of distance from whatever whatever's going on with our relationship to ourselves which has a lot of complicated layers and a lot of stories and narratives about why we shouldn't be giving ourselves our due, you know, our due love or due attention or due attunement. Well, if we can fall in love with our personality type, now we have an access point to go, oh, and I'm, I come with that pre-wiring, right? This thing that I've created so much appreciation for, well, that's part of me. And so now it becomes a little easier to pour love into this type and then bring the type into the self and go, well, maybe I can both show and receive love, you know, from myself. Yeah. I think when people get into personality types, they're often in three broad categories. Career. What, what do I do with my career? What, what are my aptitudes? What am I wired for? Relationships. How do I relate to other people? You know, how do I get along with my friends, coworkers, my partner? And then I think the other part that really is underserved, but it's the identity level, who I am, how I give myself self-love. Right. What do I want in life? Like all these things. And I think that a lot of people come to personality type and they get awakened to this idea of self-love. Like, wow, you mean I'm not weird and I'm broken? I'm actually okay. Yeah. I'm just wired different than the other people in my life. That's a new thing. Well, I can love myself then. I don't have to compare myself to my dad or my mom or okay. my partner or somebody that expects something else of me. I have proper expectations of myself because now I know who I am and how I'm wired. Yep. No, it's not exactly who you are, but it is how you wa you're wired, right? And so that idea of expectations... I think that's really the lever here. When we understand our personality type, we, we know how we're wired now, how we're learning information. Because all, all our personality type tells us is how we learn information, the worldview we see the world in, and then how we make decisions on that information that we perceive and we're attuned to. That's really what our personality type informs us of, our, our Myers-Briggs personality type. And so for ESTJ, you, know, you move through the world and, and you see it a particular way, you make decisions a particular way. And knowing that about yourself, I think that gives us access for self-love for this type. Yeah. Well, and you said the right, I mean, you said the right word, Joel. You said Congratulations word, to me. Yeah, that's right. Good job. <laughs> Gold star. Uh, you said setting expectations. And I think modeling how we develop a healthy relationship with other people helps us understand how we can develop a healthy relationship with ourselves. Yeah. And a part of that is setting reasonable expectations. Like, um, like we mentioned, you don't withhold love from somebody in your life simply because they didn't like perform in a certain way. Yeah. But we can have like, if we're going to have a good relationship with another person, we should have reasonable expectations that they meet. Otherwise, if we allow them to do whatever they want to, whenever they want to, without regard for us or their ecosystem, that's not going to create a sustainable relationship. It creates one-sidedness or a one-sided relationship. Yeah. So when we, when we have, um, when we model that to create a, a sustainable relationship with self, so to speak, or a healthy relationship to the self, then we have to ask ourselves what are reasonable expectations we can set for the self. And what type helps us determine is uh, what is a reasonable expectation? Mm -hmm. How I come pre-wired will tell me a bunch of stuff about what I'm naturally attuned to and wired for. Like you said, the framework that I tend to see relation, you know, the, the world through my relationship to the world through the priority structure, I tend to make my best decisions based off of those are based on Carl Jung's cognitive functions. And each of the personality types has what's called a cognitive function stack, or we call it a car model. Yeah. And, um, and we don't have the same expectations for ourselves in each of these positions. We should have a varied set of expectations. So um, part of the reason why we tend to you know, part of the obstruction we create for ourselves to feeling self-love is we let ourselves off the hook when we should be pushing ourselves harder. And so we don't feel a full sense of self-confidence because we know that we're leaving money on the table, that we're letting ourselves off the hook when we shouldn't be. And we also beat ourselves up for things that we should yeah. have ex more reasonable expectations around what we can actually accomplish there. So we're letting ourselves off the hook and then we're beating ourselves up. And type helps us understand, well, Maybe maybe we should be pushing ourselves in different arenas and cutting ourselves some slack in other areas. Yeah. Okay, quick orientation for you listening or watching. Uh, a lot of people that are listening or watching right now know this, but I just want to make sure in case you're new or you don't have this framework, the best way to look at this 
is to use our personality hierarchy car model. It's a really easy way to look at the ESTJ personality type. The, the, obviously, the best, best way is to have our ESTJ owner's manual for your personality. It's got a bunch of information about how to get in flow, how to get out of loops, even trauma looping or gripping, the grip behavior that you're gripped by not to be able to act, uh, stuck in your emotions, whatever. There's a bunch of information there and advice for ESTJs on how to navigate their life and set up their life. It's a fantastic program, ESTJ owner's manual. Inside of that owner's manual, is something we call the car model. And this lays out your personality type, the framework of how you're wired as an ESTJ. So imagine your mind is a four passenger car. The driver of your car as an ESTJ is something we call effectiveness. Its technical name is extroverted thinking. It's about getting real world results in the outer world, making decisions, managing resource. Next to the driver is a co-pilot for the ESTJ. Its nickname is memory. That's what we call it. Its technical name is introverted sensing. It's all about perceiving the world by what has come before and tracking changes over time, where we've come from, what traditions do we have, what are the standards we all meet and measure and hold up in, in the world. And that's the co-pilot. That's the, the second function that rounds out an ESTJ. You go right behind that in the car, like you can just imagine a car. Uh, the 10-year-old, we call it, process is a process called extrovert intuition. That's its technical name. We've nicknamed it exploration. It's about Quick pattern making and finding disparate connections for things that maybe seemingly aren't connected, but something new comes out of it. A lot of imagination lives here. By the way, I'm blitzing through this. There's way more to all of these. I'm just kind of giving the trim tab, almost like a table of contents for this. And then the, uh, the three-year-old right behind the driver is a process called introverted feeling. That's its technical name, and we've nicknamed it authenticity. It's about the deeper emotions, core values, motivations, uh, who we are as people and how we're going to show up and maybe the, the expression we want to bring to the world. So if you, if you can kind of follow along that car model, again, the owner's manual is the best way to do this, but if you just have that in your mind's eye, that car model as we go through this, we're going to walk through this and talk about the expectations and self-love with this framework in mind. Right, exactly. All right. So, um, and you can also, uh, you know, there's, there's other resources, like we've got podcasts on the ESTJ personality mm -hmm. type that goes deeper. So please feel free to do that if you're, if you're starting out. Uh, that said, I'm just going to go straight into those functions. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let's do uh, it. So. I got my notebook. It's not on the ground. It's on my it's lap. It's not on your ground. Let's do it. It's on your leg. So you're, you're, you're <laughs> set to go. So, uh, this first function, what you, that you mentioned is the driver, um, technical name is dominant function of extroverted thinking or effectiveness. Uh, so in some models, um, Dr. John Beebe's model part in particular, he calls this. Uh, one half of the axis of relating to self, the other half is the, th the three-year-old or the inferior function of introverted feeling or authenticity. And the reason why that's really important is um, this is how we identify ourselves. This is how we see who we are in the world is through the lens of this particular function. And for ESTJ types, that's extroverted thinking or effectiveness. So it's a big part of their self-definition. A big part of their identity is wrapped up in this function. Yeah. And this process, this cognitive function is focused, I would say, first and foremost, on progress, right? It's about making things happen in the outside world, getting results. Uh, does it work? And how can I measure the progress of this thing working? Yeah. So that phrase, progress is better than perfection. That's a very extroverted thinking or effectiveness way of seeing things. Yeah. It's progress, not perfection. Yeah, and when we have progress, we can use the resource from that progress to create further progress. That's right, exactly. Uh, it's associated with um, sort of uh, practical problem solving. It's related to um, objectivity yeah. and not having your personal feelings muddy the waters of the things that have to be done. It doesn't matter how you feel, it still has to happen, so make it happen. It's associated with um, clear direction, right? Decisiveness, right? It's very obvious what needs to happen, so let's go make it happen. And, um, and setting clear expectations with others about what your expectations for them are. And so oftentimes it gets associated with leadership because these are all fabulous qu qualities and characteristics in a leader. So uh, as a first function, as a driver function or a dominant, the expectations one has for oneself here should be high, mm -hmm. right? Like if you're not, if you have ESTJ preferences and, and there's a, uh, there's a stereotype that ESTJs are never lazy. There's a stereotype that ESTJs are always like, 
driving towards making things happen and yeah. um, that they always get it done. And there's like a, like everybody, uh, everybody thinks of that ESTJ manager, right. That they've had because it's very common for ESTJs to take management positions. So they conflate it with that one guy or that one woman that they worked for yeah. or worked with. Um, but that's not necessarily always true. There are EST, there are people with ESTJ preferences that are not making things happen in the world. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might have a, Antonia. <laughs> that might experience a lazy streak yeah. or might have, and I've seen this happen multiple times, might have been raised in a context where every time they tried to get themselves attuned to a schedule, tried to get themselves making things happen, build competencies, make things happen in the world, the context frustrated it yeah. over and over and over again. And so they became people who stopped giving their all to this part of themselves. It just be, it, it got put on autopilot yeah. as a thing as a way that they think, but it doesn't necessarily show up as a way of producing, right? And uh, and that means that there's money on the table. Yeah, this undermines an ability to receive love from the self. If that's the case, if the person isn't making progress, if they're not seeing results in their life, uh, because they they know they should be doing better. If we know we should be doing better, if we know we should, like there's more in us that we are not manifesting, it undermines our self-confidence and it undermines our ability to receive full love from ourselves because we go, well, I don't deserve it, mm. right? It's not like we can deserve love from ourselves. It's not like we can earn it. But this is the part of ourselves that if we're not taking advantage of it, if we're not giving it our all, that's how we'll start to feel. So then, I mean, tuning back into this idea of expectations, that's kind of the, that's the heuristic or that's the word I'm going to carry through all of this. The expectation is pretty high here for an ESTJ. This part of yourself, if you're an ESTJ listening or watching right now, you can expect a lot because you have a lot of capacity here. Now, you may not have the skill built, but you probably have the natural wiring and talent for these things. So yeah, you might still have to go and build some skill, get some knowledge, get some experience, but you should be able to expand the capacity of this part of yourself pretty big like and and so to be in relationship with the self around this you know that container for the love to be passed back and forth with the self this this can have high expectations yeah. this isn't a part of you that you let a pass like oh, well you know he's trying all right <laughs> it's not that kind of energy it's like no get up we got to do this we got to get on this kind of thing and i will love myself freely regardless and be forgiving and loving toward myself but i really do expect myself to show up here yep that's really what we're we're positing for this part of you well, and if it gets really bad, the person can use this function to be destructive. Yeah. So instead of making progress and building things, they're actually destu destructive and regressive. Yeah. Right. They're not making progress. They're doing the opposite. And that really is a recipe for self-loathing for somebody with ESTJ preferences, even if they're not registering that, even if they're not like, no, I love myself. But at the end of the day, in the quiet times at night, when you're like laying in bed thinking, there's not a lot of like, like there's a sense of sometimes a crippling sense of insecurity of I'm wasting time. I'm wasting my life. I'm wasting my opportunities. Yeah. I could be doing more. I think there's a sentiment. I just want to take a quick caveat here because there is a sentiment in the world that um, the, it's almost like this function is wrong. Like this part of somebody is wrong because they're attuned to the non people metrics. Mm -hmm. they're I mean, people can be factored, but they're tuned to resource bottom lines. And I think in our modern, like, world it's like that's not okay you need to kick people into account people are the highest ethic yeah it's nice that you got that business thing done but or that career management thing or whatever it is but really it's about people it's about the double bottom line it's about more of the soft stuff and sometimes a person that has this wiring doesn't really they're not their aptitude isn't tuned into that it's not that they don't care about people they care deeply about people and we're going to talk about that in a little bit here how how this type shows up but the expectation from the world is that you're going to be really you're going to have a kind of a soft well, when we get to the FJ personality types, it's, it's, they, there's an expectation that these types will show up like a, a feeler judger in the Myers-Briggs system, right? With an extroverted feeling or harmony framework. It's like, ooh, this, it's almost like this can be demonized sometimes in our world. We really need that other one instead. Mm -hmm. And that could be an unconscious message that you undervalue what you bring if you're an ESTJ because you're like, well, I'm not doing it right. I don't care about people enough or something you might tell yourself because the world's telling you this. Yeah. But you can care about people with this function and with this framework. It's totally possible. Well, I think actually the world needs a lot more of this. We, we had a lot before. And, uh, and there, were, there have been time periods in history where there's been some overreach in the energy of this function. Yeah. 
But I think right now we're starving for this. We're starving for like people who think in not double bottom line, but bottom line thinking. Like yeah. sometimes taking people into consideration as individuals actually ends up harming them. Yeah. Like weirdly enough, I've seen this happen where an individual like like overly taking them into consideration. I do this all the time I well, <laughs> with our team. That's how I've seen it. <laughs> I try to like build something around the person rather than making them fit the system. And then the system has all these like rogue things now. Or over giving to an individual in yeah. a way that's not healthy for them. Like yeah. overly taking them into consideration when really they never had that kind of relationship with you. Yeah. And so they're not going to give back. It's not reciprocal. It's like, like just hyper focusing on the individual is not, it, that's not what the world exclusively needs. We need that energy in there. Yeah. But we don't only need that energy. We need people who are willing to do hard things, even if nobody likes it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm an ESTJ and I'm looking for an access point for self-love here. Mm -hmm. Expectation access point for self-love here. Let's see if we can kind of zoom in on that. What, what, how do we land this here? What, what this part of me, my driver part is an ESTJ if I'm an ESTJ listening right now. Right. Uh, well, ambition isn't a dirty word. And so if you feel like a drive to make bigger and bigger things happen, to, to cr build career capital to take care of the people in your life through primarily the mechanism of resource, not prime, like, like not prime, not exclusively, but primarily like you're taking care of people by making sure that they are resourced and okay. Yeah. Uh, those are all, those are good. Those are beautiful. Those are necessary. So as you see yourself doing that and taking on more and taking on more responsibility and being decisive and helping lead things, projects, et cetera, while you're building your competencies and capacities for it, you you have well earned self confidence, yeah, right. Like you have earned the the uh, the sustainable relationship with the self. Uh, you can't earn love again. Continue to free flow love, but this is a wonderful access point for self trust and self confidence. And uh, a lack of those two things oftentimes obstruct people from feeling the full yeah. love for themselves. Okay, so this idea of ambition. And that also would include hierarchy, which you have to be okay with, because yep. often if you have a lot of resource you're managing, that means you're over top of all that resource, and that includes people, and that means a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. It's probably very easy for you as an ESTJ, if you're listening, and this is your type, for you to think that this is how you earn love. Like This is probably where it goes off the rails the most, is if yes. you do have competence, and you do follow your ambition, and you do get hierarchy, it's like, you might get to the top and go, why don't I feel like I love myself here? Yes. I should, I, I've gotten all this accolades. I've generated all this resource. I still don't feel good about myself. I still don't have self-love with all this accomplishment. So you could have all the accomplishment and still not have self-love. And that, I think that's really where we have to unlock for the STJ at this point. Yes, exactly. Uh, you're not going to earn love through, through the resource and through the skill and through the management, the management. Yeah. But you will undermine your ability to feel full self-love if you are not taking advantage of those, those talents. So it's not, this is not the formula for love, but an undermining element is if you aren't, go, you're not pushing yourself as hard as you could in this way. Like yeah. you will feel so much more self-trust and self-confidence if you are not leaving money on the table here. So it's more like, it's less of a, here's how you earn love. I mean, it's not a formula for earning love, but it is a component in making sure that you're not undermining your own sense of self-confidence, which when you do that, then it's harder to feel a full expression of love. So it's more about undermining than it is about the transactional nature of self-love. And I think that's really what we're trying to say is yep. self-love is not transactional and right. ESTJs in particular, a couple other types are like this as well, can conflate that very easily. Yes. So we're trying to create a separation. Yeah, I know. It's for a, you specifically. Everything I'm saying probably sounds very convoluted, but just basically like do your best here. Don't don't be dishonest with yourself about what your best is. Be honest about yeah. what your best is. Do your best and uh, you'll remove an obstruction yeah. for feeling self-love. And I think we're talking to two different ESTJs. One is one that hasn't gotten into their full ambitious self yet. I think that's who you're speaking to. Yes. And I'm speaking to the one that's sitting at the top of a company right. or high management, middle management maybe. That's like, I keep accomplishing, but I don't feel any better about myself. Right. Which is why it's not the end of the, of the algorithm. Exactly. It's not the end of the formula. Okay. So let's move over to the co-pilot, technically called the auxiliary cognitive function. So if you're looking at your car model, driver is extroverted thinking effectiveness. The co-pilot auxiliary function is memory. That's our nickname for it. Introverted sensing. This is another really powerful, proficient part of you as an ESTJ. How do we talk about self-love in this area? 
Okay. So, uh, so Dr. John Beebe, while we're referencing John throughout the podcast, um, John says that this function is more about, he calls it our axis of relating to others. Yeah. And he ascribes to this a parental energy. So we actually end up instinctively using this co-pilot function in service to others more so than we instinctively or naturally use it in service to ourselves unlike that first that driver function we use it all the time like we're using it for others for ourselves we identify as that for ourselves but we use it all the time this function we find ourselves um, more kicking into it really pulling it up when somebody else has a need and we go oh i'll help serve that so there's two different mechanisms for really using this part of ourselves to access self-love. So um, uh, uh, the first one is service, right? And when we see ourselves as contributors to the outside world, it is easier for us to appreciate who we are because all of us have a mechanism inside of us that wants to contribute, right? That's just like a natural part of humaning. We're social creatures. We want to make sure that we are contributing to society. And so... Uh, with introverted sensing or memory, this is the part of ourselves that wants to create stability for others. We want to see them have a good life. We yeah. want to see them have like do like in particular for ESTJ preferences, an ESTJ wants to see that people have um, sort of like a, a wisdom about their choices and that they are going to be doing things that um, are stable yeah. and create a support structure for them. Well, it goes back to this idea of progress that the dominant or driver function for an ESTJ would have, which is the idea of like, I want to get to a beachhead or a plateau and then I want to keep going. I don't want to regress. And I think this part of an ESTJ shows up to say, yeah, this is the vanguard part of me that kind of has the standards and procedures and the th processes in place so we don't regress. Mm -hmm. It keeps, and not just me, but like a lot more than me, society as a whole, maybe my community, neighborhood, business, whatever I'm, I'm in tuned with, like we need to keep it all operating well, guys. And that's kind of this part of us, that, that, that part of the ESTJ that comes up. Yes, exactly. So it's going to offer uh, advice with a measured approach. Yeah. It's going to uh, encourage people to take actions that allow them to be comfortable because comfort is like the ultimate litmus that we're safe. Like it's hard to feel a sense of like sort of uh, rested into your self comfort mm -hmm. if you have to be vigilant that there's a predator around or that you're going to lose all of this any minute. So comfort, the reason why introverted it's, sensing- It's why we built outhouses. Right. Because <laughs> yeah. otherwise we're like, it could go down any moment. I need to be in this little like box here to feel yeah. safe. Well, and also so that people don't see our butts. But, well. <laughs> but I think that's a big piece of it. Sure. <laughs> so uh, there's a, uh, uh, okay. So I'm Sorry, I, I totally derailed you. So <laughs> comfort is part of the oh. through line. The reason why introverted sensing or memory, it ten, like we tend to associate it with comfort and comfort seeking is that comfort is a message. It's a message that we're okay, that everything is stable right now. There's a sense of homeostasis. Yeah. And so uh, ESTJ types help others create that sense of homeostasis, or at least that th that's what they want for people. Because if we feel comfortable, we feel good. We know that everything's going to be okay. So on the one hand, an access to self-love is finding opportunities to help others out in this way, to help them create stability. And, um, and to, to be in tuned with other people's, you know, their health, their, uh, their safety, their sense of everyday well-being. Like that needs to be, um, you need to put yourself in situations where you can observe yourself passing that gift on to others. Yeah. I, I have a story of an ESTJ that worked with my, my family's nonprofit organization. It came in and started doing some sales and communication calls with different group leaders to try to book them for you know, programs and things. And one of the things that this guy did, ESTJ Preferences, really focused in on building a lot of the processes that not just he could use, but other people that are doing the same, because everybody had their own individual kind of standards of what they did. Some people kept their notes over here, over here. It was all over the place. And it was really difficult every week for comparing notes and knowing where the money was and who was booked for what. It was all over the place. He spent a lot of time organizing that and, and systematizing and bringing everybody into a single system around all of this and it made everybody's lives better like he really gave a gift to everyone in the in the entire business the whole nonprofit. we were able to operate better because he was lending this part of himself to us 
which I'm certainly not as equipped as he was for that, is ENFP preferences. So I think that's a way, as an example of how this could show up, even at a small scale, to really offer help to others. Yeah. Well, and then uh, bonus if people will show you gratitude and appreciation. Oh, yeah. Right. Like which you, they may not. <laughs> which they might not. <laughs> and if you can find opportunities, like, I mean, you want to be in a situation that appreciates you. And that's a big piece of what people with ESTJ preferences can offer. Now, uh, there are some ESTJ types who are not in a great way in the same way that they might not be pushing their extroverted thinking or effectiveness to make as much progress as they can, um, to have as much gain as they can. Yeah. In the same way, some ESTJ types are kind of avoidant of this, right? They don't watch themselves show up with this attention to detail and helping other people create these, you know, like a, um, a more measured approach. And if that's the case, then they're going to undermine their ability to feel full self-love because they know they're avoiding something that's kind of important, almost like a responsibility. Parental energy is responsible and oftentimes it's thankless. We talk about that a lot. So it's great when people say thank you and show gratitude and appreciation, but parental energy will do it anyway, right? Because it's like, that's parent energy. It's like, well, maybe, maybe my child someday when they have their own kids will thank me, but I'm not holding my breath, right? So uh, a, a piece of an ESTJ's ability to experience full self-love is their willingness to give to the world in this way and watch themselves improve the lives of other people. So mm -hmm. that's the first piece. The second piece is to self-parent with this function, meaning getting your own life in order making sure that you have those processes and procedures and stability for yourself as well. Yeah. And there's a sense that all ESTJs are super stable, but that's not totally the case. Like we know ESTJ types who are maybe creative subtypes. We've talked about subtypes in other podcasts. If an ESTJ has a tendency to be a creative subtype, sometimes they don't have a lot of stability at all for themselves. And yeah. so being willing to self-parent with this and create your own structure and your own measured response and make sure that you like you're in a place of of security and comfort. This is another way that um an e somebody with ESTJ preferences can pour love and uh, can show love to themselves and also receive it. Yeah. I I almost think of it like uh, a hairdresser or a car mechanic. You ever go to like a somebody that does hair and you're like, "Oh my god, if you have a haircut like that, I'm in big trouble." <laughs> or like my uncle used to fix cars and his cars were always broken down all the time. I'm like, what the heck? It's like you do it for others, but you don't do it for the self. And there's so many ESTJs that could organize an office like I just mentioned, but then their own calendar and their own organization systems are all over the place. It's just for them. They're like, oh, I can struggle through. It's fine. I'll do that someday. And it's really, no, you know, I'm going to do this for myself. I'm going to take the weekend. I'm going to put my calendar together. I'm going to organize these things. I'm going to create some kind of system or structure. I do it for others. Why shouldn't I do this for myself? Right. And so I think that's, um, yeah, that's, uh, I think that's part of where they, they show up. Yep, I totally agree. So, uh, so that's a piece of the, um, the, the feeling of full sense of self-love and self-appreciation through, through self-parenting and parenting others, watching yourself contribute and then contributing to yourself in this way. Yeah. Then you move on to the 10-year-old function in the car model or what's technically called the tertiary. For people with ESTJ preferences, this is extroverted intuition or exploration. And John calls this eternal child energy. So what does that mean to have an eternal child energy associated with the function? Well, this is the first time we run into a sense of uncertainty. Your first two functions, the driver and the co-pilot, this is a place of certainty. We have a, a, and that's one of the reasons why we, uh, it, we feel the best when we push ourselves here. Because there's no natural insecurity that says we can't. So if we feel a higher degree of certainty and we go, no, I know I can do that. And we don't, our inner wisdom knows that about ourselves. We know we're letting ourselves off the hook when we really shouldn't. Now, I do want to make it clear that no matter what personality type we're talking about, there are time periods in our lives where just in general, we shouldn't be pushing ourselves, right? Like maybe we're going through like a really hard time or um, we're, we're going through a healing, you know, healing traumas. I'm not talking about those time periods. I'm talking about like the usual day-to-day -day experience for somebody with ESTJ preferences. The usual day-to-day -day is push yourself, have higher expectations for yourself and your driver and co-pilot. By the time you get to the 10-year-old function though, we need to have more reasonable expectations for ourselves hmm. because this is a more uncertain childlike part of who we are. So if we have unreasonable expectations for a child, 
somebody who has recently had a 10 year old who's now 11. If I have unreasonable expectations for her, she's just going to become frustrated and demoralized because she's not going to, she's not going to be able to show up like an adult, right? If I have adult like expectations for her, all I'm going to do is crush her spirit. So this is the first time in our functions that we need to, we really need to understand what it means to have a reasonable expectation so that if we're not as good in this as we want to be or wish ourselves to be, that it's not demoralizing, that we're not beating ourselves up unnecessarily for something that we have a relationship to, but not necessarily the same amount of natural talent or um, certainty in. Yeah, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember maybe some anecdotal ways this can show up in well, we expect too much of it. I, I actually don't think it's we expect too much of this. It's more of like it's we we hand our an ESTJ. It's not like they expect a lot from this. It's more that they just hand themselves over to it. And it really makes me think of the balance between this ten year old function and the co pilot. It's really the it's it you can't really talk about the one without the other because it's so depend they're so dependent interdependent on each other in how they show up for any personality type. So the moment I think about what would an e, like I'm running through my head going what would an e, what would an ESTJ putting more expectation on themselves in this area be than they should what would that look like in a real tangible expression I'm like I can't think of an example or even make one up off the top of my head but I can think of things where they would indulge this part of themselves or not like it could it could ruin their getting serious part of themselves like it it drags them down into more like distraction and lack of focus well I think that the first thing that pops up for me is uh, somebody who's over diversified in how and how they're trying to get their resource. Yeah, right. They might have an expectation that th this part of them might say, "You need to diversify in order to feel truly secure. You need to have what? What is that like? Um, old standard of like seven streams of income. Yeah, I need to have like seven streams of income in order to feel truly like secure. So there might be an expectation that they can keep that many plates spinning. Yeah. And now the over diversification and do that many things well. Right. Exactly. I can do all of these different things at the same time. And that, in my opinion, that would be a high expectation for somebody with ESTJ preferences to be able to like monitor and keep all the maintenance, all those plates spinning and then discover that yeah. now it's starting to fall apart. They'll feel like ideas. They won't feel like expectations. It won't feel like responsibility, but you feel like opportunity. And optimism. That's what's so insidious about it. That's why it's so hard, especially for an ESTJ, probably ESFJs too in this, is that it's not going to feel like it's a heavy responsibility. It's going to feel like, no, this is good. I'm opening up seven things or however many things, diversification. That's a positive thing. That's why it's so hard here to get a hold of this. Yes. And so when something fails because of uh, I should be doing this, exactly. The person might not go, I had a high expectation for myself. Yep. It's going to be like, oh, I tried to do this thing and I failed, right? Yeah. And then you beat yourself up that you weren't able to manage all of it when you feel like you should, right? Yeah. I should be able to have managed all of that. Well, yep. that's an expectation you set for yourself that might have been too heavy a lift. So I think uh, this is the first place where self-love requires an ESTJ to have more reasonable expectations. And extroverted intuition or exploration, this is a function that's like, it, it's, it wants to understand the complexities of life. It wonder, uh, wants to understand a bigger picture. It wants to kind of guess how things are going to go down. It likes to play in an, a creative, innovative, you know, brainstorming space. Uh, and so uh, there might be a fear that if I don't show up with like all these great creative ideas, or if I'm not innovative enough, then people, people won't see me as creative as I like to think of myself as. So in a situation like that, it might be uh, putting too much expectation on other people's reflection back about how innovative and creative you are as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's one more thing I want to mention on this yeah. one too. Because it's part of, so the axis of relating to, to others, I mentioned your the introverted sensing or memory is part of that. But the other side of the axis is this eternal child energy, this extroverted intuition or exploration. So because of, this is part of how we relate to others or, or like we, we understand ourselves, this part of ourselves through our relationships, it can become a little showboaty. It can, it can be seeking 
a lot of validation yeah. for how good it is. Just like a 10 year old might be seeking validation for others that I did a good job, right? Yeah. So a part of what might undermine an ESTJ's self love is if they are experiencing, they're not experiencing from other people validation around this function. So a big part of, um, do I keep using the phrase big part? So uh, a way that an ESTJ can uh, can use this part of themselves or build a healthier relationship to self with this function is to have it in service of the parental energy, meaning that the relationship is now parent-child, not child looking for all the other quote-unquote adults in the world to give it validation. So if the parental energy is um, best utilized in helping serve society, helping serve other people, then looking for creative opportunities and creative ways to help other people create stability in their life, to have a more measured approach. This is one of the best ways that the 10-year-old can feel so good about itself. I'm helping other people, right? A 10-year-old that is very clear about its task, gets to work, does a good job, gets everybody's kudos that you did a great job. That 10-year-old is going to feel so good and resource. It's going to feel so good about itself. So when this part of ourselves can help support a more mature aspect of our cognition, the parental energy of introverted sensing or memory, when the two can work in tandem with each other and balance themselves out in service to others, that just feels amazing. Yeah. And the way that we do that is um, there, they, it almost kind of feels like, and we've mentioned this in the previous podcast, I'll probably mention this in every one, that when it comes to functions, we call them polarities because it kind of feels like two sides of the same coin. When heads are up, tails are naturally down. And when you flip it, tails are up and heads are down. So you can see one half of the coin most of the time, unless the coin is spinning. So yeah. for an ESTJ, for example, that, that memory, if it's up, it's the other facing down. The polarity here is extrovert intuition, exploration. Mm -hmm. And then if reversed. That's right. So you're saying one is activated over the other. And we're seeing an expression of one, either the 10-year-old or the co-pilot, 10-year-old or co-pilot at one time, back and forth. Exactly. Except when a coin is spinning, then you can see both sides and you see them simultaneously so fast that they almost merge into the same thing. Yeah. This is what Carl Jung called a transcendent function. So when a, somebody with ESTJ preferences figures out a way to blend their co-pilot and 10-year-old, their introverted sensing memory and extroverted intuition exploration to a point where you almost can't tell where one begins and the other one ends, they almost look like the same thing. And they're particularly using that in service to others, coming up with innovative, creative ideas to help other people establish, you know, security and stability. When they can come up with creative ways to make things better, processes, procedures, um, through lines, you know, just like optimizing everything around them in terms of like stabilizing it. Yeah. This is when they feel the best about this part of who they are because they know that they're using everything they've got. They're, they're squeezing all the juice out of this part of themselves in, uh, in a way where they have reasonable expectations that they're not going to wow the world just with intuition, but they can serve and do a really good job of integrating their intuition into their sensing. And that just feels so tasty. Yeah. So let's move over to the final cognitive function we're going to talk about today at the three-year-old level. It's technically the inferior cognitive function. These are really big words. Uh, these are all technical names. The technical name for this function for an ESTJ is introverted feeling. We've nicknamed it authenticity. It's about being authentic. It's about resonance with your core values, knowing your identity, knowing the morality and the ethics you bring to the world, and also motivations. It's usually good at tracking own, your own motivations. And it's like that you know, kind of thing like, well, if I was that person, I'd probably be feeling this. And so I can kind of guess how they're feeling because that's how I'd be feeling in the situation. That's really how it works often for people to read emotion with it. Now, this is at a, a pretty uncertain place for an ESTJ. I mean, it probably has the certainty of about a three-year-old. That's the, that's the framework we give it. Right. And that doesn't mean that there can't be skill here. It doesn't mean that an ESTJ doesn't have a career that puts them here. Maybe they're in the arts, you know, theater or something, and they have to do a lot of self-expression or writing or getting the human experience in some way. So there's, there's access here. Skill can be built here. This is a part of you as an ESTJ. And you're going to be pretty uncertain here. Almost every time you're in this space, you just don't know, like you can do all the work you want. You can build all the skill you want and it always feel a little uncertain. Am I doing this right? Am I, what's my identity? Am I a good person? What are my motivations? Are they good? Are they complex? Or they are complex. 
uh, you know, secret is it's very complex, but sometimes you can't feel all of it as an ESTJ. It's like you're not tuned to that. You're tuned more to the other side of your driver part. So when it gets here, this can be something that causes us to feel a lack of self-love. We can, there's, a, there's a relationship with this part of ourselves that can undermine our feeling of self-love if, if we're in ESTJ or have ESTJ preference. Well, any of us in this part of us, but for ESTJs, authenticity could undermine you. Right. So let's talk about this. Yeah. Um, so the, the phrase I always like to, th- or I always think of when we get to this part of ourselves is deeply uncertain. Mm-hmm. And like you said, it doesn't mean that sk- like skill can't be developed. It absolutely can. Yep. And John says, this is the other side of the axis of relating to self. So unlike the sensing and the intuit, um, intuitive parts of us, when, we get, when an ESTJ goes to the feeling function, this is about their identity and relationship to themselves. Yeah, so I just want to make sure we're in, your, in the map in your head, that car model, it's a quadrant, you know, left and right. On the right side is the axis of relating to others. On the left side is the axis of relating to self. Exactly. Right. And so this part of us that's so deeply uncertain for somebody with ESTJ preferences, it, there's, a, there's an instinct to not look at it because, and particularly with people with ESTJ preferences, the driver function of extroverted thinking or effectiveness is so decisive, yeah. right? That's, that not only do they feel highly certain here, like we all do in our driver, but the function itself is a decisive function. And so to feel deep uncertainty can be extremely unsettling, right? And so for somebody with these preferences, um, it, the, the, the impulse might be to just not look at it, to not build a relationship, to kind of hope that it goes away yeah, or to feel deeply undermined by it, right? Like my feelings get in the way of progress. Uh, m- emotional depth is, you know, is, is me being lazy, right? There might be a lot of demonizing of this part, which is definitely an obstruction to feeling full self-love. The challenge with, I think, somebody having this as, a, as an inferior as well or as a three-year-old function is that um, introverted feeling or authenticity, one of its nicest qualities is that it's self-validating. So one thing that ESTJs struggle with is validating themselves outside of their accomplishments. So this might feel like a contradiction to what I said earlier, which is, you know, make progress, be ambitious, you know, do all of those things. The reason why is... If you don't, you're going to lack self-trust and self-confidence because you'll know that there's more in you that you could be giving. And at the same time, you're also going to need to learn how to self-validate without using the external markers that I'm a good person because I make things happen. Yeah. The integration of this function, the way to not avoid it, not push it away, which creates obstructions to self-love, the way to integrate it and use it for a self-love is to go, Oh, I'm allowed to validate myself. I'm allowed to think I'm a good person without having to have these external markers. I can think I'm a person who's worthy of love and relationship. I'm a person who can see themselves as value without, uh, without external evidence. Yeah. Well, I can give that value to myself. And it is, I think this is a challenge for some ESTJs, not all, but some that continue to make the money, get the fame, create the business, get the job make the product, create the art. I mean, I'm, I'm putting in a lot of business frames, but it it's, can be applied to all sorts of stuff. But the metric or the delivery or the body of work, the output, look, I'm, I'm worthy of love, right, from the world and myself now, maybe they would ask. Yeah. And that's what I alluded to be, in the very beginning is like, just because you have all of that doesn't mean you automatically give yourself permission for self-love. This part of you is a part that's a secret part of you that's going to unlock that mm-hmm. ability to say, wait a minute, I have to be the one to show myself love first. It doesn't matter what I've done in the outer world. It doesn't change that part of the inner part of me, the inner knowing of who I am and my really intimate relationship with self. Yeah. And that's, a, that's sometimes a really heavy lift. So we were talking about expectations. Yes. The expectation is that it's going to be hard, right? The expectation is that- Confusing. Some, confusing. Uncertain. Mm-hmm. The expectation is that you're going to, some days, you're going to question your value. It without your accomplishments. You're going to question whether or not you're a good person. You're going to question w- whether or not you have, um, that you have intrinsic worth. Well, in an out- outer world failures, quote unquote failures or setbacks, phew, that's when it's going to hit the hardest. Mm-hmm. Like when you're doing well and the world's giving a lot of value, the money's coming in or the success is happening or people like you, right. 
yeah, I mean, it might be easy to find a little self-love there because, the val- again, the outer world validation. So you're like, oh, I don't have a problem. The moments things don't go well, mm-hmm. that's when this really is acute. Yeah. And you, I think you feel it as an ESTJ the most. Yeah. Well, and I'm thinking, I mean, the, the way you're talking about, um, th- there's like a kind of a stereotype around ESTJs with that those kinds of markers. But I was thinking about like maybe an ESTJ stay-at-home mom. Yeah. Who is looking for validation uh, and and you know has metricized whether or not she's done this great job as an ESTJ by whether or not her children are succeeding in certain ways, right? Or like they're winning awards, or you know, like or 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 something like the, it can it can change from person to person what the metric is they're looking for that validates themselves. Yeah, and when they don't get those, like you said, it can be really undermining to self love, and that feels like withholding. Right. That feels like it feels like a, I'm going to withhold self-love until I earn it through these metrics. And if somebody with ESTJ preferences might be the most susceptible to this kind of thinking or yeah. one of the types that's the most susceptible. And so the idea of, no, I actually need to love myself through anything because I have worth. I have intrinsic worth as living organic tissue with consciousness that reflects the cosmos back to itself. That's and there's only one version of me. There's no version that's ever existed before. There's no version that's ever going to exist into the future. I'm the only way that the cosmos can know itself with this distinctive perspective. I have intrinsic worth. Yeah. Right? I have value outside of all of my accomplishments. And it's this function. It's integrating it, not avoiding it, not feeling that deep uncertainty and going, I'm just not going to look at that emotions, ick or whatever. It's going, well, okay, I'm going to sit with my emotions. I'm going to understand the depth of my humanity. I'm going to recognize that no nobody has a hundred percent positive intent. Nobody is perfect at their you know their virtues or values or whatever. Like we all make mistakes, and I do too because I'm also human. Yeah, and that doesn't undermine my ability to love myself. I, I will say that we're in a very emotional time of the world, and I would argue that us feelers in this world often are not responsible with how much emotion is okay now. That we've been very irresponsible of it. And I could see an ESTJ getting turned off to emotion because of the people that they see expressing it and doing it badly and poorly <laughs> and going, ooh, that means I'm going to be like one of those people, mm-hmm. those whiny people or those, like, they could couch this in that I'm way. A for victim them. or. Yeah. Or whatever they would see, like, ugh, it just like, really turns off, I think, thinker types to see indulgent emotions from, fe- well, anybody it could be thinkers as well. But we have this culture where we're allowed to indulge our emotions. I think it's nice that we're able to express emotion a lot. I'm an emotional person. I'm a feeler. But I, I can almost see like a thinker, especially in ECJ, going, oh, man, I don't want to be like the, like, particularly because that co-pilot of memory is so tuned into the standards of society and what's expected. I don't want to go there because I don't want to help set a new expectation of what's okay. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to avoid that. And now it makes it harder to do self-love. Like there's so much here that yeah. we could talk. We're going to run out of time. We are probably already ran out of time. Yeah. <laughs> we need to probably wrap this up. But okay. I think there's so much here that can hijack an ESTJ yeah. um, in particular. And I think that dialing that in around that introverted feeling authenticity part is really key. And again, we've got more podcasts. If you want to explore this further, we talk about introverted feeling or authenticity. We talk about ESTJs on multiple, whether it's career or just a you know general type advice and all these kinds of things. I think that's really good. Um, let's pivot now, though. I mean, we can keep weaving in ECJ at I, I, the end, maybe what they can take away, but. Well, I do have one thing I want to mention yeah, okay, about this. Yeah, okay, do that. Because okay? I, I, I have a place I want to go here. Okay. Uh, so, so this is about expression, um, uh, expressing the identity, expressing the self. Yeah. And extroverted thinking effectiveness, the driver, and introverted feeling authenticity, the three-year-old, it can model, especially when that co-pilot and 10-year-old of memory and exploration or introverted sensing, uh, extroverted intuition, when it's styled in a way to balance those two so that working in tandem together, that can be inspirational to the driver and the three-year-old to do the same. Yeah. Because when we integrate that function, what it means is that we've made peace with the uncertainty of it and we love ourselves through the uncertainty of it. And we go, for somebody with ESTJ preferences, it's okay for me to self-express. It's okay for me to be an individual. I have worth and value outside of my accomplishments, but I can bring this in and I can, demand, I, I can balance the demands of extroverted thinking or effectiveness. I can, de- I can balance all of the demands of producing, producing and progress and ambition with my introverted feeling or authenticity values. I can balance those two things. I can, make them, I can turn them into a transcendent function as well. And that goes into relating to self. So the key to all of this 
is eventually getting to a place where you're integrating that part of yourself and that's truly removing all obstructions to self-love. It's like the last final piece of being willing to hang there, be willing to humanize the self, to feel that sense of, of validation, of, of self-validation. All of that together, all four of those components and qualities working in tandem removes all the obstructions, all of the things that we've set up, all the gatekeepers to us feeling a sense of true self-love. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about what can the rest of us, the other 15 personality types learn from the ESTJ's framework of self-love. So as we look at the ESTJ and we are helping them find self-love, how, how can the rest of us learn from this? What's a takeaway that we can apply to ourselves through the process? Well, I think when an ESTJ has dialed this in, when they've really tapped into true self-love, there's no need for bluster. There's mm -hmm. no need to try to brag or prove to other people how good they are. There's no like they've stopped the transactional component of love because they've built a non-transactional relationship to self. Like they'll, they're going to love themselves through anything. And so because of that, what ends up what ends up happening and it's inspirational, but you have to watch for it. This is the difference. Like we talked about ESFPs and how they can be inspirational through their like grit and their resilience. When an ESTJ has really dialed this in, what you see is a, is a form of quiet benevolence. You'll see a supportive person who does so without needing validation from others. Uh, sometimes this can look like staying up late and helping a colleague work on a project, right? Just kind of volunteering like, no, I'll help you out. Uh, it can look like offering support in... Um, in a, sort of a quiet way, like as in, um, I, I, we don't have to publicize this. Let's just solve this problem for you as an individual, like helping, uh, helping a person with a, a difficult issue and challenge without needing it necessarily to be public, right? Like they just quietly help somebody. Yeah. Or maybe um, an example could be like a manager that offers um, like support to an employee that might be going through a hard time like offer extra resources while still maintaining their dignity and their privacy, mm. right? It's like, or maybe it's a mentorship. Taking on extra training, mm -hmm. helping guide other people at the office or in your personal life or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, or, or, or being attracted to just kind of taking somebody under your wing and helping them sort of break ground for them, but, a, a, you know, a trail you've walked. So it's a, uh, it can, I think people with this, with ESTJ preferences can be quite inspirational in their, their ability to do these things for, them, for themselves, but also for other people without having to trumpet it. And it's like, yeah, no, that's just a solid person. That's just a really solid person who has figured out how to be of service in a practical way to others without, um, without any fanfare, with just doing it beautifully and preserving everybody's dignity. Uh, and, and I think I personally find that highly inspirational. Well, love is a complex topic and it's a complex concept. And a lot of people have a lot of different views on love and a lot of different aspects of it. But I think when we talk about it in the framework we're talking about it, I think we could say, I think we do say that love is a verb. It's an action we take toward others and the self. Like love is expressed. Like without expression, how do you know, how did, how does the love get passed? So if you take that, love is a verb, it's about action. ESTJs can often be about action. They can often be about expressing something or, or well, expressing, it's my, my words for it, right? Because I'm introverted feeling. It's about doing something. It's about action in the outer world. And I think that's a really beautiful part of the ESTJ that I tune into to learn from, to say one of the things they can teach us, this benevolent, uh, what did you say? No, quiet benevolence. Quiet benevolence, right? Quiet benevolence. Um, that's action focused. It's quiet, but it's still benevolence is action. It's doing something, giving something, contributing something. I'm looking at an ESTJ going, an ESTJ that's doing that as an ENFP preferences, I can learn a lot by going, okay, how are they able to do that without needing the credit? Because an ES ENFP, at least me as an ENFP, I want the credit for everything. I want the authorship. That's like what, that's actually the reward. More than the money, more than the status, it's knowing my name was on something. That's, I know that's my motivation. So, but I'm looking at that going, well, what if I didn't need the credit? That, that's a really interesting way to look at contributing through action, through showing love, through a verb. Like, I think that's a lot I can personally learn from an ESTJ. And I think everybody has something they could probably tune into that around the quiet benevolence. I'd be very interested to how somebody else of a different type 
is interpreting that and how they can t- get a takeaway for their own life and how they're wired. Yeah. Like, how, what do you, what's your takeaway? When you think about quiet benevolence, how do you relate it? Maybe give another example. How would you think in terms of relating it to yourself? Is it something that you, I mean, you don't really need credit for things already. So no, but the I, same wouldn't apply to you. I admire, um, well, I, the reason why I take inspiration from it is uh, more about the willingness to have people misunderstand your intent. Or like your character. If yeah. you don't, if you do it without the fanfare, it means that people might that they might not see. So it's they their might business. not. That's right. So they might t- take an yeah. accurate assessment of your character. I mean, how many people have like well, they may project bad intent onto it. That's right. Like railed against somebody who you know was like pushing them too hard or whatever. Uh, so you're just maybe, greedy. They're just wanting what they want. It's like they have no idea the motivation. And they don't see all this good work because that's not being. That's not being uh, advertised, right? Yeah. And so the willingness to have people misunderstand your character and intent and still continue to do it because you're, you're validating that you're doing it because it's important to you and you want to be of service and because you love yourself and you want that abundance of self-love to, you know, to, to then be demonstrated to others. Yeah. That, that to me, it's like, well, that, that's hard to do. It's hard to do. To not need, in your case, you're calling it credit. In my case, I'm, I'm calling it uh, being willing to, to have your intent misconstrued. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yet, uh, I, I, I mean, what's the phrase? Um, be a good person, but don't take time to prove it. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm not trying to prove it. I'm just being it. And, uh, and, and I think that's the lesson I take. Yeah. Okay. So if you're an ESTJ... Do you, do you resonate with this idea of quiet benevolence? Do you, do you see that in yourself sometimes or all the time? Like, how do you resonate with that idea? As we walk through the car model of your personality, and we talked about the expectations of the different cognitive functions you'll use in, as an ESTJ, does that resonate too? Does that, yeah, that's probably about the expectation I also resonate with. Or maybe there's something we didn't talk about that's coming up for you as we discuss this. We do want to hear from you. And we want to hear from all types around this too, because I think there's some takeaways we all can have in creating more understanding with the ESTJ personality type in general. But if you're an ESTJ or someone that has an ESTJ in your life, come over to our website, personalityhacker.com. Directly below this episode, feel free to leave a comment, ask a question, or more importantly, share your story. Do you have a story of how you've gone through something like this or self-love? Do you have a story of how it's been hard to love yourself, you figured out how to, or maybe you did love yourself at once and now you've fallen off from that. You're like, man, I I didn't know how that happened, but I, I'm having a hard time to love myself right now. Or What's your relationship to self-love? Again, come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this episode, make your voice heard. Yeah. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on uh, lots of different podcasting platforms. I think we should say it. Get Subscribe where you get your podcasts. That's right. It's probably that's the best way to say that's it right. now at this point. Like, subscribe, ring bells, whatever it is you need to do. <laughs> but there is an action you do love, which is on iTunes specifically. Yes. So you should mention that. Uh, if you would la- leave a rating and review on Ooh. iTunes. Somebody left a, f- a few reviews recently and yeah. it was... You get fed by these. I do. You. It's very nourishing to me to read the reviews. So if you would do that for me, that would be awesome. But uh, I will say in all of this, one of the best things you can do for yourself, because sometimes, sometimes self-love is just a little bit of self-understanding. Mm-hmm. And as we mentioned, having the right expectations for yourself, right? Like where you should you go hard? Like, yes, absolutely. Make that driver and that co-pilot, optimize them, get all the juice out of the squeeze, Watch yourself become an excellent version of yourself and have reasonable expectations for your 10-year-old and your three-year-old in your car model, which is don't push yourself too hard there because it's just going to be demoralizing. Well, how do you know all of those secrets? Well, you get yourself an ESTJ owner's manual. Yeah. So the owner's manual at personalityhacker.com will help walk you through the cognition of your mind and some of the phenomena that happens because we don't all have owner's manuals for ourselves. We didn't come equipped with them. The purpose of these owner's manuals is to have all the information you need to avoid some of the worst pitfalls of the ESTJ personality type and optimize the best parts of yourself so that you don't have any obstructions to self-love, but you also create fantastic relationships with your world around you, with the people in your life that are important to you, with your ecosystem, create an ergonomic life for you as somebody with ESTJ preferences. And this goes for all 16 other personality types. We made an owner's manual because you didn't come equipped with one. So come get your owner's manual so that you can navigate through life in the most, uh, the most empowered and bespoke way. Yeah. And if you already have some of your personality dialed in on the owner's manual side, because we have a lot of people there 
they've already been part of the owner's manual program. The other lever is really getting on your life path. And that's something that if it's open right now for enrollment, I would definitely check out. It's about taking the fact that you know you're an ESTJ and then attuning it to the path that you need to be on or that you want to be on to get the results that you want, to become the person you want, whatever it is that you want in life. It's really about designing that life path based on how you're wired as a personality. Yeah. So come over and check both those things. Those are the two levers that are the most impactful for your life. Again, come make your voice heard. And my name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. Mm-hmm.